Good evening, everyone. My name is Juliane Kempfield. I'm the director here at Deutsches Haus at NYU, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's panel discussion, Climate Change and Activism, which is part of our series, The States We're In, A New Age in uh, Transatlantic um, Relations. It's a, it's a crazy time. We were just talking about it upstairs. So much is going on that we all have a hard time processing what happens politically on both sides of the Atlantic, here in the US, in Germany, elsewhere in Europe, in South America. We just had the elections in Brazil. We had uh, state elections in Germany. Uh, the, the populist um, rise seems to continue. We have elections coming up here. If you haven't looked at my necklace, it says vote. So all of you <laughs> who can vote, go vote on November 6 and talk to all your friends and family uh, all over who, who, who can vote, even uh, if they have different opinions, uh, con persuade them, convince them to change their minds so that they all share your opinion. Um, I don't know if that's the right approach, but, but do go vote. Um, having said that, of course, there are all these you know, things going on right now, but then there is climate change. And climate change is, I think, more on everybody's mind now, but still people need to be more aware of what is actually happening and, and recent reports have of course shown that uh, time is short, things really need to change and a lot of people don't take that quite seriously enough and a lot of people in power don't take that as serious as they should for all our benefits. And uh, having said that, we are very excited to have uh, our four distinguished panelists here tonight to talk about climate change and activism. We have uh, Miranda Massey here, we have uh, uh, Peggy Weil, we have Justin Bryce Goriglia and Elke Weber, and I will introduce them in more detail shortly so that you have a chance to, to get a better um, idea of their of their bio, but before we start, I just want to say um, the program I mentioned earlier, the states we are in, a new age in transatlantic relations, is part of a series of events, and I just want to briefly mention two upcoming events in this series. We have a panel on uh, civil society and political engagement coming up on November 9th as part of the series, and we have another panel on economic inequality and populism coming up on November um, 15th or 16th. Now I can't remember, but <laughs> but you can ask me later if you're interested and I'll I'll look it up. So if, if you, as I say, if you like this event, you might want to consider coming to those two events. And one more event I briefly want to promote um, is our event on belonging. Nora Crook's uh, amazing visual uh, uh, graphic uh, memoir um, about her family and uh, her family's time in Nazi Germany, which is an astonishing graphic novel, and we have her in conversation with uh, uh, Nicole Ruddick uh, next Monday. So, over the last two decades, the artist and environmental activist Justin Bryce Guerrilla has developed a unique transdisciplinary art practice working in collaboration with scientists, philosophers, and journalists to explore the important ecological issues of our time. In 2016, Guerrilla became the first artist to fly on Earth science missions with NASA. His solo show, Earthworks, Mapping the Anthropocene, which received an NEA grant, is currently on display at the Fisher Museum of Art at USC in collaboration with the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles. His work entitled We Are the Asteroid is currently on display in Storm King Art Center. Storm King Art Center's climate-focused show Indicators Artist on Climate Change and as a public art installation on the Chicago Navy Pier. Quarelia is a Howard Foundation Fellow at Brown University and an artist in residence at the Anchorage Museum and Woods Hole Research Center. Moving on to Miranda Massey. She's the founder and director of the Climate Museum, which is finishing its first year of public programming. Congratulations. <laughs> Having presented two exhibitions, in Human Time and Climate Signals, in addition to a range of other events. 
Previously, Miranda was legal director of the social justice organization New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, where she also served as an interim executive director. Before her time at NYLPI, she was a civil rights impact litigator in which role she won professional honors, including Fletcher Foundation and W.E.B. Du Bois Institute fellowships. Her board service has included the Center for Popular Democracy and a large Head Start organization serving the children of migrant farm workers. She was a Wasserstein Public Interest Fellow at Harvard Law School and a mentor in residence at Yale Law School. Elke Weber is a professor of psychology and public affairs at Princeton University, where she holds the Gerhard R. Endlinger Professorship in Energy and the Environment and directs the Behavioral Science for Policy Lab. In her prior appointment at Columbia University, she co-directed the Earth Institute's Center for Research on Environmental Decisions and the Center for Decision Sciences. She's an expert on behavioral models of decision-making under risk and uncertainty, investigating psychologically and neurally plausible ways to model individual differences in risk-taking and discounting, especially, no, specifically in risky financial situations and environmental decisions. Weber is past president of the Society for Mathematical Psychology, the Society for Judgment and Decision-Making, and the Society for Neuroeconomics. Uh, prior to this panel, I had no idea what neuroeconomics <laughs> is, so <laughs> I've already learned something before it has started. She has served on advisory committees of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences related to human dimensions and global change, and as lead author in Working Group 3 for the fifth and sixth assessment report of the U.N. Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Now we're moved on to the fourth person, so just one more person and then we'll start. Um, oh, and in between, I would like to thank my colleagues and especially Zara for working very hard on making this panel happen and also our interns, Emily and Elena. Uh, have a good first day, Elena. <laughs> Welcome to Deutsches House. And to our student worker, our photographer and videographer. So, whew. Um, and I'll have one more thing, and that I'll wait until the very end to give it more prominence. Uh, all right, Peggy Weil is an artist whose works explore our relationship with our changing physical, digital, and sociopolitical landscapes. Her work is multidisciplinary, ranging from digital media, VR, and games to large-scale video projections and print. Her series of underscapes and overscapes extend our view of the landscape to the deep time and deep space of climate change. 88 Cores, the Climate Museum's inaugural exhibition in New York City, was featured at the United Nations for the Secretary General's Address on Climate Action in 2018. Earlier work pioneered the use of digital media, set, such as virtual environments and games, for human rights and political redistricting. And now the final thanks goes to um, the Federal Republic of Germany, uh, Germany's funds from the European Recovery Program, ERP, of the Federal Ministry for Economy and Energy, BMWI, who gave us the funding for this program. This is the worst place to thank, because <laughs> they have such a complicated name, but, but I'd like to thank them anyway. After this lengthy and boring introduction, please join me in welcoming our distinguished panelists. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you so much, and uh, I have the pleasure of uh, setting us off on our journey this evening. Uh, we do live in complicated times and difficult times, and I sometimes find some solace uh, in going to museums. Uh, this is the National Portrait Gallery uh, in, in Washington, uh, and uh, this president, this dead president, reminds us of the fact that we have been divided against ourselves in the past. Uh, we are a very polarized country, we are also a polarized world. It's developed countries against developing countries, the rich against the poor, the haves against the have-nots. <laughs> and lastly, climate change action uh, versus climate change denial. 
uh, I have done a lot of work on decisions under uncertainty. Some of them having to do with uh, insufficient pension savings, you know, not saving enough for our future selves, uh, not uh, the wrong kind of eating behaviors, you know, sort of you know, wanting our uh, pie now as opposed to worrying about you know, sort of our health uh, in 20 or 30 years' time. None of them are as difficult as decisions that we make with respect to the environment. Uh, they all have this, a very similar recipe. You know, we have to sacrifice now uh, with some benefits down the road towards our future self, but also towards future generations, towards people in faraway uh, countries. Uh, the risks in the case of climate change, much more so than pension savings uh, or wrong eating habits, are statistical, they're abstract, you know, they're gonna be in the future. Uh, the solutions are quite complicated. They require sustained action. It's not a single thing we can do and get it over with and move on to, towards other issues. There is no silver bullet. You know, a carbon tax would be great. It's not going to solve everything. You know, uh, being able to sequester the carbon that's in the air right now, technological solutions, uh, moving on you know, to, to fusion, uh, to uh, solar power, it are all going to be great, but just part of the solution. Uh, investing in the future, we need financial solutions. We need social solutions. We have to change our current lifestyles, but all of these have to happen in parallel, and that's not an easy uh, task to accomplish. Um, on top of that, you know, sort of, uh, the costs you know, are for sure. Uh, we don't like costs. You know. Hurting, losing something hurts us twice as badly as getting something feels good. That's not a good recipe for change. Uh, the benefits of action in this space are uncertain. They are down the road. It's easy to discount them. Uh, and you know, collective action suggests that even if we sacrifice, if not, nobody else does, you know, our sacrifice is for naught. So what that leads to uh, is oftentimes status quo bias. You know, we, 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 we know we should be changing, but somehow we don't get around to changing. And that's true both at the individual level, also at the uh, political level, at the economic level, uh, at the collective level. And together with the status quo bias, we oftentimes have a lack of imagination. We get stuck on how we're doing things right now. This is an apocryphal quote from uh, Henry Ford who said, if I had asked people what they wanted when he was inventing the automobile, they would have said faster horses. Okay. Now, sometimes I say maybe faster horses wouldn't have been such a bad idea. <laughs> 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 but certainly at the time, the invention of the automobile did improve public welfare. So, so, so what to do? Where, where to go? Uh, uh, sometimes you know, the solution uh, put forth by foundations, you know, by scientists, is to provide more information. If, if there's not enough action on, on, on what we know, then maybe we have to provide more information. And it might be true that sometimes there are information deficits, but I think many more of our deficits have to do with motivation, have to do with you know, sort of cognitive barriers towards processing this, 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 this risk in front of us. Uh, I think where we do have an information deficit is to communicate effective action in the space, and not just effective action sort of at, 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 at the high level, but at, at the individual level. Feasible solutions that we all can engage in. Uh, Paul Hawken has a nice uh, book, Drawdown, that provides us with 80 answers you know, to the climate crisis. Uh, Rare, which is a very uh, uh, effective in a conservation uh, NGO, uh, is looking at 30 of those you know, as behavioral solutions that we can all engage in, and I think if you just go to any of those two organizations, you know, they have nice guides to what these actions are. So I think people are working on this information deficit. Uh, we also need some coordination, and people have to know that coordinated action actually can be effective. It's not a drop in the bucket if, if uh, 8 billion people are doing it 100 times a day, yeah, or 365 times a year. Uh, coordination that will tie together the silver buckshot that we have. No silver bullet, but there are lots of things that everybody, each sector of society, each individual actually can contribute. Um, cooperation will be required beyond local communities. We actually are pretty good at cooperating with people that we know. Yeah? We, that, you know the, 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 the tragedy of the commons is not a foregone conclusion. It's a drama, but a drama that might have a good end. Yeah? But we have to figure out how to cooperate uh, across larger groups you know, that might not know each other uh, individually anymore. Um, and I think social processes and social norms oftentimes are more effective solutions than economic incentives, you know, because for all the reasons that I mentioned, you know, long time horizon, statistical information, discounting of, 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 of benefits, uh, and, and the large weight uh, that the, the perceived losses have. Uh, the argument I want to make is all hands on deck. You know, everybody is required and everybody can make a contribution. That includes us, the general public. Uh, our individual energy use makes a difference. Our purchasing power can be applied in appropriate ways. Political will can be exerted. Yes, do go and vote. 
uh, but also the corporate sector can play a role. CEOs, venture capitalists, you know, they're fads in investing right now, and you know, maybe investing in a sustainable future isn't the current fad. Let's make it the current fad. Uh, companies can play a role from reinsurance uh, to shipping uh, to uh, you know, developing new technologies. Uh, architects and infrastructure designers are locking right now with their current designs of office buildings, of transportation systems. They're locking in our energy consumption for the next 50 to 100 years. Yeah? They can be, mo be made more aware of the need for sustainability uh, in their building practices. Politicians, uh, you know, many politicians have been arguing we should be leading rather than following public opinion. We should not expect people to embrace change. Nobody likes change. I don't like change. I don't like to update my software. Yeah? <laughs> I just do it because my IT person will yell at me if I don't. Yeah? Well, we, maybe we need people that we elect to actually sort of, uh, to, to construct our uh, future our strategic planning for us to actually f you know, do the job rather than fall falling, falling down on the job. Uh, for this audience today, I want to especially focus on writers and on artists. Uh, this gets back to the fact that climate change is oftentimes being depicted as a statistical phenomenon. Yeah? It's a, the, the, the weather, you know, our uh, conditions, uh, sea levels yeah, in, in 50, 100 years' time, that's very abstract, and that's not something that scares us naturally, that, that touches us naturally. Uh, so we need images, we need stories that transmit both the consequences of action, utopias, and the consequences of inaction, dystopias. Yeah, but I think yeah, you know, everybody loves a great dystopia and they're very compelling, but we do need utopias that show us a way how to get from here to there uh, in concrete ways. Uh, and I think museums uh, are very uh, neutral places where we can meet to discuss these kind of issues that are scary that are divisive, that have become ideologically charged. So we need neutral meeting grounds uh, to think about these things in ways that are not sort of charged with uh, uh, ideological uh, baggage, uh, but you know, where we can meet and, 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 and think about individual fates. And I think you know, sort of both the Climate Museum here in New York City, uh, UN Life, which is an online museum the UN is developing right now, uh, the, 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 the Portrait Gallery, you name it, they're all meeting grounds for us to think about these issues uh, and debate uh, and uh, consider consequences and action. Uh, let me sort of mention one other museum that I visited a month ago uh, in Philadelphia, the uh, new museum for the American Revolution. And I was struck by the fact that the, the kind of uh, institutions and the kind of political values we take for granted right now, 250 years ago, were considered revolutionary. You know, they were considered out there, you know, sort of really crazy, crazy stuff. We fought a, 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 a war to actually institute those. Uh, and so the question is, what will it take for us to look down 50, 100 years from now on the current day as the same time where we thought sustainable development was a revolutionary concept? You know, how, how do we get there from here? We do know we need triggering events. You know, we needed the shot heard around the world to start the American Revolution, even though there were lots of political and economic reasons for it. Uh, we needed Pearl Harbor. We needed an attack on American territory to start us, uh, the American uh, country off in, in, into World War II. Uh, and so the question is, how do we get from here to there? It re will require vision and leadership, but also all hands on deck, action on, on everybody's part, and as I said, on the part of artists, utopias that, that, that show the way. So let me finish with one final slide. Uh, I oftentimes get asked whether I'm optimistic or pessimistic about sort of uh, the, the, the ability of, of, of the human species to, uh, to, to, to address this, this climate challenge. And what I want to argue is that Amory Lovins, you know, who's a climate scientist uh, and the founder of the Rocky Mountain Institute, actually had a very good answer to that question. He basically argues that neither one is, is, is the right attitude because both of them are uh, examples of fatalism. You know, the optimist says things have to get better. The pessimist says things have to get, uh, can get worse. Uh, but what he believes in is what he calls applied hope. <coughs> Things can and do get better, but you have to make them so. And what I mean, you, I mean all of us. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. And among many other things, um, thanks to Deutsches House. And I also want to note that the Climate Museum, which is just in the final moments of our first year of public programming would not exist without the other three panelists um, here tonight. Elka has been, was one of our earliest advisory council members, has been an invaluable member of our extended team. And the two brilliant artists you're going to hear from later are the two main artists whose work helped us enact some of the ideas that Elka was just talking about. So it's really a privilege to be speaking with the three of you. 
we believe, our thesis is that museums can be a very significant part of building the consensus for climate action, the unity that Elka was talking about. Museums are, first of all, enormously popular. This is the first 24 hours um, of uh, the Museum of Tomorrow in Brazil. It's not coincidentally focused on sustainability, and um, that's a time lapse and on a loop of its first 24 hours. Here in the US, guess how many people, guess how many museum visits there are in a year? Someone throw out a number. 20, 20, I got 20 million, 850 million. So if you add major league sporting events and the top 20 amusement parks, so that's Disney plus SeaWorld plus Six Flags and the other 17, and national parks visitorship, you start to get close to 850 million. Why are museums so popular? So that's one of the reasons why they have so much transformative, generative capacity in terms of building consensus for climate action. Museums inspire awe. They draw us into a newly physical relationship. If I talk to you about the endangered kelp forests that are suffering because of climate change, it's one thing. If I show you a bunch of numbers about kelp coverage in the ocean, that's a second thing. And if you visit the kelp forest at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, that is a different thing entirely. Even seeing this picture probably makes you think and feel differently about kelp. Museums communicate our values by stepping into a museum. A part of you is saying, is enacting the fact that something matters to us in our common culture. This is the still somewhat new Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture. Obviously, um, not a monument to simple progress. These values are under extraordinary, vicious attack at the moment. But by the building of this museum, we express that uh, th black history and culture are part of who we are as an American people, and that they're a central part of our values, and that we're going to build a beautiful space where people can come together and think and feel about them together. Museums are places of trust. This is the 9-11 Museum a process, a, a, excuse me, a center for processing trauma, among other things, where trust is particularly important. But even on less traumatic subjects, museums are places where people have trust and where they're more likely to trust each other. Studies bear this out. In particular, the public trusts museums to deliver information about climate change. Museums finally build community because they build trust, because they inspire awe, because they express our shared, if contested, values. Museums are places where community is experienced and felt. We're trying to mobilize all of those transformative capacities to build for action and dialogue on climate. When I say dialogue on climate, that may sound like a small thing, but right now in the US, or more precisely in March of 2018, 65% of people in the US were anxious about climate change, and only 5% of us were speaking about it with any regularity. That's extraordinary. That's 60% of the population in the US walking around anxious, but silent. So breaking that silence is no small thing. Because stop and think about it. We can't take action together on something we're not talking about. It is a fundamental precondition. So building dialogue is a very, very significant part of what we do as a precondition for climate action. Not that it's ever going to be any one thing. It's a buckshot approach, not a bullet approach. But without, without breaking the climate silence, um, we simply can't make significant progress in this crisis that we face, that we've created out of our talent and ambition and drive. Um, so our basic watchwords are to be multi and interdisciplinary. So I'm going to show you some slides of community outreach work that we did based on the spectacular artistic projects that Peggy and Justin shared with us. Um, we did some science outreach and education and other outreach and education that I'll show you some slides of in a moment. We're solutions focused. We can't candy coat the reality of the crisis, um, but research bears out that in order to keep people engaged, you need to focus on pathways forward uh, together. 
participatory for obvious reasons in community building. Um, I'm going to trust, unless somebody objects, that you've had time to take in the uh, very uh, confirming comments on the cards. Museums and museum programming can bridge cultural and generational divides in a way that's really powerful. And I wanted to share this image to make that point. Um, these are six New York City youth, three of them very experienced uh, spoken word performers and who didn't know anything about climate change or climate justice issues, and three of them members of our Youth Advisory Council who knew a lot about climate change and climate justice, but had never performed poetry before. And we brought them together and um, took them to an impact investment conference out in Utah where a bunch of um, middle-aged, white, wealthy investors were utterly galvanized by their performance about climate justice, um, both in the more uh, traditional sense of race and class and who's hurt and affected worst and, and most powerfully by climate change as the crisis moves forward, uh, but also in the even to me more profound and incontrovertible sense of intergenerational uh, justice claims around climate. When young people make claims around the injustice of what's being done in terms of their own ability to imagine a positive future for themselves, everybody in the room, young and old alike, is galvanized. Um, and that uh, is one of the ways in which arts and arts programming can bridge really profound tribalisms that exist in our culture and build unity and consensus around, around the need for climate action. This is our first temporary hub. Um, it uh, closed yesterday. Uh, we had it up for a couple of months on Governor's Island, and one of the programs it included was an interactive based on the piece of Justin's that we have up at 10 sites around the city, which consists of three line traffic signs with climate focused aphorisms on them. They're designed to draw people into the climate conversation. So you were able to make your own climate aphorism in one of the rooms. Um, and we discovered that one of the things we need to do next time we have an interactive like this is serve alcohol at all times. Um, <laughs> Um, and, uh, and, and invite a lot of children, because sober children jump at the chance to write their own climate aphorisms, and so do tipsy adults. Um, but the third group of people is a little harder to coax into action. We, we, we figured out some tactics, and Elka will tell you about them later when we're, when we're chatting. Um, we made it seem normative to do, to do a climate signal, and that actually helped, and people got excited then. Um, this was a second major component of what we were showing there, this is uh, an, another example of trying to bridge divides to show people the possibilities that exist in climate action. This is a show with beautiful large-scale portraits of, well, it's 10 portraits with 11 people. You see the two teenage girls there. Um, they, uh, they're the co-founders of the Youth Climate March in New York City that happened over the summer. Um, and right next to them on the left is the Director of Sustainable Finance for Goldman Sachs. So we had a range of different people both human diversity and also um, climate diversity in terms of the mode of the impact that they were making um, on in terms of building for climate progress. And now uh, turning to the work of Peggy Weil, uh, we were privileged to present a beautiful show of Peggy's work, 88 Cores, which is a film. There you see on the back wall, it's a four and a half hour film that uh, descends through the Greenland ice sheet and entirely changes one's sense of time and space and melting polar ice. Um, there was a spectacular uh, soundtrack associated with it, and the room was like a chapel for science. Um, and here, we, brought, we invited teenagers from across New York City to apply for a workshop on bringing science and art together for climate communications that could draw their peers into climate ac action. And th so this is a, an educational piece of the workshop, which was then followed by a design competition. And the work that was produced was just extraordinarily galvanizing. And here, programming around Justin's brilliant piece up at 10 sites around New York City, um, this is the, 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 signal, the kind of signal that uh, non-drunk adults are nervous about writing. Um, 
uh, you see up there on the right. Uh, this is Sunset Park, Brooklyn. And we had a day at which every sign had at least one climate scientist stationed. And we had advertised this in the community. And so it was called Ask a Scientist Day. And people came out. And in Sunset Park, Spanish, Mandarin, Cantonese, and English are all spoken at at saturation levels, so there were so we had uh, tra translators on hand, and there were periods during which we were having climate conversations in four different languages, um, which was a which was um, exactly the kind of programming that we want to do to help build the conversation and make people feel like they can have a role to play, uh, because we know they can but because of the scale of the problem, because of the way it's distributed in time and space, as Elka was saying, it's very difficult for people to feel that they have a role. So everything is at stake in what we all do next and what we all choose to do next. We can't escape the world on the left. That's just after Michael, so that photo is only a couple of weeks old. Um, that will continue to happen, um, and we can't exclusively be the world on the right. Uh, but we can choose how we define ourselves in these times um, and how we choose to make alliances and relate to each other and build for incredibly urgent and broad action on this most pressing problem of all. There are a lot of times where I'm sure everybody in this room has encountered, um, you, you know, if, if people have seen the the... Um, quadrant where the x-axis is importance and the y-axis is urgency and the problem is like how do you get to the things that are very important but not urgent well here we have something that could not be more important and it could not be more urgent and so we need all hands on deck um, including the hands of um, artists of all kinds uh, to help us come together to address the crisis thank you Hello. Um, I'm, I'm honored to be here today, and uh, I'm going to give you guys a really quick rundown of some of the work that I do. Um, as almost everybody in here knows, that we're living in this great mass extinction event right now, the sixth extinction, and this is an event that is um, unlike anything that, you know, we, it's, it's happened five other times before in the last 4.5 billion years. Um, but this is a, an ecological catastrophe and, and global warming and climate change. I mean, these are just incredibly powerful forces. Um, and the average person is really quite content staying at home and watching Netflix and eating uh, ice cream and kind of living out their, their kind of daily lives. Um, this is a crisis, as you guys know, is, is, is something that will dwarf World War II um, it's the greatest challenge that humanity has ever faced. And it really reflects, um, you know, I, I think today we see that it, there's a, a tremendous disconnect between uh, us and, and the natural world. And one of the things that I do as an artist is try to um, bridge that disconnect with my work. Um, and art has this amazing power to really um, open our minds to new possibilities and give us new perspectives. Um, this is one of my favorite um, proverbs here. This is a, a Chinese proverb. It says, to know and not to act is not to know. And that's kind of the basis of, of a lot of my work is thinking about this notion of how um, you, when you start going out into the world and you start experiencing things and learning things, um, you, you begin to understand and, and, and learn things and you have to I feel you start to have an obligation to start sharing them. Um, the ecological crisis is incredibly complex. It's incredibly multidimensional. And it's operating on so many levels um, that for me personally, I find myself needing multiple languages to communicate what I'm seeing and what I'm experiencing. And so I love this notion of, I'd never heard this buckshot versus uh, silver buckshot versus the silver bullet. But I guess I'm kind of a silver buckshot type of guy, uh, or artist. Um, I primarily collaborate with philosophers, scientists, and journalists, and I do that because I, I, need, uh, I need ideas and I need to be informed and, and I want to have a more holistic, ontologically rooted uh, worldview. 
And so in doing so, my art becomes really very much a research practice to investigate the world and to try to help forge a deeper understanding of uh, the important ecological issues of our time. And I, I, have a, I do have a, f a favorite quote that kind of relates to this, and, and it's, it's J.G. J. G. Ballard who, who said, that in the past, artists used to produce fictions, but today we live in a world of fictions and artists need to produce reality. And so I really see myself as a kind of a reality producer. Um, and uh, a lot of the, my work to get into reality is you have to be out in the field. You have to be out in, in on the ground and doing lots of research. And my art ends up becoming a product of my research. So this is a, right after Hurricane Irma and Maria struck Puerto Rico, uh, I took uh, the art, another artist, uh, Ai Weiwei, uh, down to Puerto Rico, and we went down there to kind of see and experience what had been happening, what had happened down there, and uh, what some of the impacts were. And we treated it very much as a, as a research trip to fuel ideas that we individually or potentially together could be working on to address uh, not only climate change, but also um, the refugee crisis that, that came out of this. Um, here, this is a picture of me in Greenland in front of the Russell Glacier. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it's very much, if you're not an Inuit, uh, a NASA scientist or a farmer, if you're not on the front lines of this stuff, it's so difficult to grasp what's happening. Um, it, you know, climate change is this thing that's, it's as Timothy Morton, the philosopher says, it's a hyper object. It's so massively distributed in space and time that it's just impossible to just, to, as humans, to try to understand it. We need teraflop type computing to be able to just barely scratch the surface and understand things. And a lot of the guys that, um, if you talk to many NASA climatologists and scientists, they'll tell you that they don't even, can't even really tell you what's actually happening. So um, anyway, as a result, I decided to call NASA up and my background is photojournalism, and I called NASA headquarters and I said, listen, I, I would really love to be going out and flying on missions with you guys because I, I wanna go out there as an artist that wants to engage with this notion of, 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 of what's happening to the planet, and we're just so far removed, the public is so far removed from these things. Um, so this is the plane that uh, eventually, it's a longer story, we only have a couple minutes here for a quick introduction, but um, I started going out and flying on missions with Operation Ice Bridge, this is several years ago, and these are eight hour flights, and that's me actually, um, and it's blind, the light is blinding up there, we're 1500 feet above the ice sheets, and um, we're, I'm laying down for about, it's an eight hour flight, and I'm lying down prone at the foot of the pilot for most of that eight hours um, and as we fly over the ice sheets and when they're, they're have all the scientists kind of studying the ice and whatnot. Um, so this is uh, from the cockpit, you can see the first hand kind of impacts that we have, that's glacial melange coming off of the Jakobshavn Glacier, which is the most important glacier in, in Greenland. Um, that's uh, very, very closely monitored. Um, it's a galloping glacier that dumps about 38 billion tons of ice into the ocean every year. So and I go out there and I take lots of pictures and video and stuff and I take it back to my studio in Brooklyn and then I start making artwork out of it. Uh, this is uh, Jakob Chauvin 1, it's 16 feet by 12 feet. This is actually out in Los Angeles right now at the Fisher Museum. This is in the Museum of Natural History actually in, in LA. Um, and you know that's it's a print on polystyrene, which is a product of the Anthropocene. It's one of the markers of the Anthropocene in the sense that it's a plastic. You know, it's, it's fossil fuel derived. It'll last forever. That image, the ice in that image there has already melted and disappeared. It's already in the oceans. It's in Brooklyn. It's washing up in the shores of Bangladesh. So it's it's disappeared, but it's preserved here forever. So I like that play. I mean, it's also two dimensional. It looks completely three dimensional. From you can get an inch away from the front of it, and you still think it's three dimensional. And so it plays on this notion of, um, of how climate change and, and the world around us, there's, that, there's a gap, right? There's a big gap in our knowledge between what we perceive and what actually exists. And so this work plays into that and it, it's, it's also, you know, plays into this notion of a uh, uh, Marshall McLuhan thing where, you know, material is the message, the medium is the message, right? So that's the, imbe it's embedded in a lot of the works I do. This is uh, actually uh, sea ice over, uh, also over Greenland. Um, and that's a panel, it's on, it's on black gesso and it's black carbon and all these other things. So um, that's the surface, so it doesn't look like a photograph, but they were, they start out as photographs and things. Um, I'll just go through here real quick. These are some of the scale, I try to work on large scales because the way it changes, it changes the 
the atmosphere inside a room. And here's a show I did in Chelsea last year, which showed off some of these works for the first time, and some of the glaciers, and it's all polystyrene. And, and then I had a show that opened at the Norton last year. It was rather ironic that the show uh, closed a few hours after it opened, because Hurricane Irma came through and closed the museum down. Um, Hurricane Irma, yeah. <laughs> she was a, a force, a force of nature. Um, so, and then uh, last year for Earth Day, I came out with an app called After Ice, and some of you may have heard of it. We got 13 million impressions on the, um, on the uh, Apple iTunes store. Um, and it essentially, it, it using working with a scientist from NASA, I was able to uh, to take your data from uh, to figure out what your elevation is, where you're standing, and so it personalizes, localizes, and visualizes sea level rise in the future. So using your your elevation, I overlap NASA's data, and then uh, the sea level rises as uh, an augmented reality situation where we're actually it's a, it's a selfie app. So you're seeing yourself in this situation. Then we did a grill installation in Venice during the Venice Biennale, um, and then. Uh, currently up around uh, the country is uh, Four Freedoms. It's, a, it's an artist-led super PAC, and we've, I've been working with them to put up some billboards. This one is actually in Oklahoma on one of the busiest highways in Oklahoma, which, as many of you might know, is the home of Jim Inhofe, uh, the, one who, the senator who brought the uh, snowball onto the floor, of the, uh, um, the floor of the Senate and threw it and is a big climate change denier. And it's also the home of Scott Pruitt. So we have this, that, and this, this aphorism is here written by Timothy Morton, uh, who's an amazing uh, philosopher who I've been, been very lucky to work with over the last year or so. Um, and he's been writing a bunch of aphorisms for me. And um, this is the work up at Storm King. So this is also with, with Timothy Morton. I was talking with him, trying to come up with um, some ways to take his, his ideas and his words and, and get them out into the broader public to raise the broad uh, you know, public's kind of consciousness of these, these issues. Um, this is called We Are the Asteroid One, and it, it, there's 10 actual pages that f flat flip through here. There's eight total aphorisms, uh, like danger anthropocentrism is, is, is one of them. We Are the Asteroid is another one. Um, and then this is the one I have up on the Chicago Navy Pier. This is We Are the Asteroid Two. This was just installed a, a few, uh, about a month ago. Um, and this has been going uh, really well because the demographic uh, of, of Chicago, it's the, it's the number one tourist attraction in the Midwest. So they get nine million visitors actually walk down that pier every year. So we got, and the demographic is, is, is the demographic we want to communicate these ideas to. And then this is the project uh, I've been working on with, with Miranda. It's up around the city. Miranda has been amazing to work with. She's put up 10 of these signs. This is much more conceptual work for me. I really just came up with, uh, came up with the basic uh, idea. Miranda knew I was working on this other piece for, for Storm King, came to me, said, listen, can we do this around the city? And I said, that would be awesome. She said, can, you, can we do it in multiple languages? I said, I was thinking about that as well, let's do it. She said, uh, can we do it like right away? And I was like, yes, let's do it. And so we um, pulled to get this together. Actually, Miranda pulled it all together. I just was, um, I was just kind of on the sidelines, really <laughs> kind of, uh, uh, just patting her back <laughs> on the back and thanking her. So um, anyway, so this is uh, up and coming down actually in a couple days. Uh, it, it ends at the uh, when, uh, on November 6th, uh, Election Day. And this is my favorite cartoon. I have to end with this. So um, Tom Toro, some of you guys might know, this brilliant cartoonist who writes who, cartoons for The New Yorker. And it says, yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. And that's kind of really the mood that I think uh, that we're, we're kind of in, you know, in the place we're in right now. Um, it's the, the politicians and the neoliberal capitalist elites are really are not going to have these conversations. It's it's the, really the role of the artists. It's the role of writers to help us uh, create those kind of uh, the path to utopia and, and and figure out how to how to move forward. And so. Um, I'm, I'm doing as much as I possibly can in, in my kind of buckshot style. So thank you very much. Thank you to Deutsche House. Of course, thank you, Miranda, who's really put this together, been incredible visionary with starting the Climate Museum. And uh, to Justin, I, I'm from LA, so I was at the show, his show at um, Fisher Museum, and I can attest that the very large 12 by 16 pieces on polystyrene are 
are really moving. You actually feel this sense of um, the, the paradox of being in something that's printed on polystyrene, which we think of as negative in a sense of preserving this, this piece of ice which is now gone. So it's, it's really very moving work. Uh, this is core one of 88 cores. Uh, it goes on like this for four hours and 29 minutes. Uh, wordless, not silent. Uh, apologies to the composer who's uh, not here. I think she has some fans in the room, uh, Celia Hollander. It's a piece about time. In a sense, I approach all of these as landscape, an extended landscape to take in the atmosphere and the, you know, the world beneath our feet. So in a sense, this is a landscape portrait of time buried within the ice, embedded within the earth. Uh, so it's a different approach than a utopia or a story. It's a sense, uh, I approach this, I approach climate change for all the reasons that Elka said, you know, with this overwhelming sense that I wasn't able to see these incomprehensible scales and these overlapping trends, the difference between weather and climate, uh, these large numbers, this uh, invisible substances, methane and CO2. And so I opted for this sense of looking at time and looking at deep space and deep time by making this rotation to a vertical section, something that looks above and, and below and back in time. Uh, Miranda had the great genius to name this installation in human time. Uh, really, I thank you over and over again for that particular name. Uh, so I, I approach these whole set of works as something I call underscapes and overscapes. Uh, I began this in 2010, 2011. I launched something called Heads Up. It was a challenge to visualize climate change. Uh, I did this because I was inspired by the ultimate underscape. I saw in a science news that there was a map of global groundwater, and it was created with data from two satellites that were orbiting the Earth, pinging the Earth for changes in gravity. And, and I, I didn't understand that at first, but it turns out that changes in gravity uh, are accounted for in the changing mass under the Earth of water, and that that can be detected and mapped from space. And I thought that was remarkable and needed to be shared. So I approached Thomson Reuters, who donated time on their signs uh, in Times Square, and I got the data from NASA JPL. So I've, I share some things here with uh, Justin. I mean, I haven't gone up in an airplane, but I've gone and worked with scientists. Uh, and then we posted the data, and Put together, I put together a panel of water scientists and designers, and we chose this animation of um, seasonal and long-term data, because we also added well data. And this was up, uh, we put this up uh, World Water Day 2012. It ran four times an hour for six months, so a lot of people saw it, uh, many of whom really responded, oh yeah, here's a better, better image. And I should mention, uh, this is a visual visualization by the Dutch artist Richard Vihan, who does really incredible work. Uh, the public aspect and the participatory aspect of this is all very important. It was one of the connections I have with Miranda. So we did an invitation to put your city on the sign and the scrolling uh, under Times Square and also on your phone. And we really got these uh, contributions, and we got this request for contributions from all over the world. And here's, here's a map, another visualization by Richard Vihan. Uh, after Heads Up, I returned to LA where I live and which many of you know is undergoing a severe drought. Uh, and I tried to make sense of this image of the Los Angeles aquifer. Uh, this was presented to me as an accurate <laughs> image. It's, um, but it appears as though there are these clear blue running, flowing you know, rivers of water under our city. And I wondered why I'd never heard of these, uh, you know, they've got names, the Silverado, the Sunnyside, the Gage, you know, why, weren't, why didn't the baseball team, why weren't they the mighty Silverados might have won the World Series, right? <laughs> uh, and, and the reason I never heard of them is because it's really an utter fiction. If you can see down here, uh, it says in the lower corner, it's an idealized view. And that made me think about it in another way, you know, with this ideal view, perhaps the city planners of 1961 can be forgiven uh, for the rampant growth and the use of water from that time because their view showed abundance. I think, and so like 
this quote that you had from Ballard, you know, this is a fictional, if accurate, representation, I wanted reality. And reality looked more like this. Uh, each of those vertical lines in that section uh, are wells, and the map is made from the substances in those wells, which are these different layers of dirt, you know, 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet. And they have these huge uh, boxes, shelves of these, at the California Science Water Center. So I imagine just descending, you know, for a real view, just descending down an elevator, going two and a half million years under Los Angeles. So I photographed each layer and really very simply just stacked them in a sense reconstituting them visually or vertically in their original orientation. And together with the artist Rafiq Anadol, we created Under LA, which is a projection of the Los Angeles aquifer onto the banks of the Los Angeles River. Uh, this was done for current LA, you can see at the top, people were watching from the First Street Bridge. This is a citywide festival in a couple locations uh, over the summer of 2016. So this didn't look like water, but this is really what water the aquifer looked like under LA. Uh, so we're back to ice cores. Uh, that first meter is the first meter you saw at the beginning. Uh, the last one is the one at the end. It's really the same, uh, I really went through the very similar process when I learned that these ice cores, uh, which are really two mile long poles of ice, and they're called thermometers, paleo thermometers, were cut and stored in you know, one meter canisters. I just wanted to put one back together again. Uh, so I was lucky enough to work with um, the scientists at the National Ice Core Lab and put together this four hour, 29 minute descent from the surface down to bedrock, which goes back 110,000 years. Uh, we ran it floor to ceiling, uh, but more important, again, for the participatory aspect is, and amazing uh, works by Miranda to make this possible. At night, we raised the shades so that passersby on Fifth Avenue could witness the light and the time and the continuous sense of time in juxtaposition with that of the city. Uh, my favorite juxtaposition here was uh, when a fire truck went by. Uh, and this provides a nice segue to a piece I'm doing now. These are geothermal cores from under the Salton Sea. The Salton Sea uh, is a, an inland sea in Southern California with a, a, a a terribly fraught environmental history. Uh, and this is, uh, I think Tomiko knows, knows this place. It's in a, um, an under, it's a public passageway. Is it underground, Tomiko? Um, kind oh, of. Oh, I'm sorry, where, where, where this, is, this is the Media Arts Nexus in Singapore. Um, it, well, it's a, it's a 15 meter long screen, uh, about six feet high at, uh, at Nanyang Technical University. Very, very long corridors. It's a public passageway in any case. So it's, it's uh, actually available now, and this is ongoing work. Uh, and then finally, as uh, Miranda, or as you mentioned in the introduction, I was really honored that, some, that prints from 88 cores were at the UN for the occasion of the Secretary General's uh, address last September on climate change. So it's my hope that these works, this extension, I mean, this is very short, intro to, to, to my work, but that this uh, work is not only narrative and it's not only prescriptive, it's also looking at how we actually see the world, making a shift from these immediate views to extending our view to see deep time, to see deep space, uh, looking at the atmosphere, looking below our feet, and maybe shifting from, you know, landscape to portrait because we must take action uh, you know and look within so thank you uh, um, so you, you talk about the climate museum engaging the public are you on the other hand engaging the corporations the governments the uh, you know the, the people who are who actually, you know, we can create pressure from below, but um, are you channeling it at the people who 
have to um, essentially be forced to actually do something on a larger scale than we can do by you know refusing to use straws and plastic bags? Not directly is the short answer. Um, but we think we need a cultural shift to enforce climate action by corporate and elected leaders. Even elected leaders who understand the intensity of the crisis and um, how destructive it is, like President Obama, have not done enough um, and have not done what they wanted to do because there hasn't been the cultural shift that we need and the public demand that we need for the correct policies. Um, so we think that work is absolutely necessary. We think activists marching in the street is absolutely necessary. We're do working on something else. I'm going to pick up on the buckshot metaphor. Um, our part of the, of the work is different from that, but that's a part of the work that we enormously value and respect and see as utterly necessary. You know, people have often said to me, so, you know, you're preaching to the choir, and I think that's a legitimate issue, but I also think that's important. Like, you need to rouse the choir. Uh, that, that's not terrible. And, and also, there's been considerable effort to reach outside of the normal bounds, and I think that's what you've just shown with the translating into many languages, going out in the public and going into Oklahoma, right? So uh, I, if, if that begins to answer your question, even though you, it was a specific question about going to the corporations. Before giving this to Elka, I'll just say, we need the choir to be singing to the congregation. And right now, I'll remind you guys, 60% of people in the US are anxious about climate change, have a basic sense um, of the basic science, and are silent about it most of the time. So empowering people to speak is really important. Yeah, I'm not sure I have of much to add. I'm, I'm not an oracle. <laughs> but uh, I think, the, I think the, 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 the part of the problem is that the asteroid is us. You know? I mean, it, 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 certain kinds of uh, dangers you know, do alert us and, and energize us. You know? And having you know, sort of the, the terrorism out there, having you know, sort of the asteroid hurling towards you know, sort of planet Earth you know, sort of is, is motivating. But what if the asteroid is us? You know, we're fighting ourselves. We're fighting our own worst tendencies, you know, sort of our, our myopia focusing on the here and now, which of course is necessary, right? We have to protect ourselves now, otherwise we're not going to be around tomorrow. But we also have to have longer time horizons, you know, and I think that's why these images, you know, that sort of tell us what happens if we don't pay attention to, to, to the future now. You know, is it going to sort of come and get us? You know, the, the planet will be fine. There's no problem with the planet. The planet probably will be better off without us. You know, we're really fighting for our own survival on this planet. That's what it comes down to. The, the project that we just did, the Climate Signals Project around New York City, um, when I originally conceived it, the idea, the first piece, that we are the asteroid piece that was ended up at Storm King, before Storm King approached me, I was thinking of this as a, as a broad, like, public art type project. I was not thinking of it as something that's shown in a museum setting where you have to pay money to get in. It was supposed to be very, very, kind of, uh, very public and, and, and kind of a way to get people thinking about this thing that is just very inconvenient to think about. So I would say that um, that work does not preach to the choir. The, the idea was, for us, was like, how do we get it out in front of everybody? And one of the things I've noticed around all the signs is everybody walking by them is looking at them, and they're reading what they're seeing. Whether or not they <laughs> believe what they're reading, but they're reading it, and it's going into their head, it's going into their minds, and it's, it's, a, it's kind of subversive in that way. Um, in Chicago, I was out there one day, and these two young girls walked by with their mother. And it flashed global warming at work. And one of the girls repeated it out loud to the mother. And she said, after that, she said, we were just discussing this in class this week. And the mother turned to her, to the daughter, and said, really? What were you discussing? And then they kept walking, and I missed, I didn't hear the rest of the conversation. But it just, at that point, I was like, it, I realized that this was actually having an impact and had an effect, and we were able to get these ideas into people's minds um, in a kind of an infectious way. So it's. Yeah, the, the reason I ask, I'm also an artist also, uh, working with global warming issues. Mechtel Schmidt is also 
uh, we're both working on, on these types of issues. You know, I have a plastic waste bleaching coral reef augmented reality piece up at the Whitney right now. I had a large uh, augmented reality installation in the, in, in the Olympic Sculpture Park in, in Seattle with the Seattle Art Museum, which reached a lot of people. And we're asking ourselves, and the reason we came to the talk to today is we're asking ourselves, how do we go to the next level? How do we, as Elke said, uh, start talking about utopias instead of dystopias? I'm very good at dystopias, thank you. Um, <laughs> and how do, how do we take it to a next level where we're not just, you know, um, consciousness raising, but where, um, you know, the energy that our artworks generate in people can be somehow uh, more effectively challenged. And there's also, if you don't know the book, uh, 2100, uh, A Dystopian Utopia by Vanessa Keith. Um, she's an architect who took, uh, um, to, uh, did a study and said, okay, what happens if the world does go through 4% uh, uh, Celsius temperature increase, what does the world look like? How can uh, we as architects and urban planners uh, visualize a world worth living in? And she brought out this book and, and, for, and she has very wonderful utopian images of the cities which are all uh, in, you know, northern Greenland and upwards or in, uh, in New Zealand. And then what she doesn't put on the net, um, what, which I've tried to put out, are all of the maps that show that between Middle Greenland and New Zealand, that it's too hot, it's too stormy, it's, uh, you can't live on the surface of the earth anymore. And uh, this is what we're s steering to, towards. It visualizes what we're steering towards with a graphic quality that scares even her so she doesn't spread them on the internet. But if you know, if you think, okay, my grandchildren are going to be living in this world where they can't live in New York because of the storms uh, and it's too hot to go above the surface of the earth, then maybe, maybe, maybe um, people will take it more earn earnestly. So we're looking for your help in understanding how we can take our art to the next level beyond conscious raising. I don't have a specific or satisfying answer to the question about you two and your art, though I really honor your question and honor your being here. I just realized, listening to you, it's amazing that none of us has mentioned the IPCC report yet tonight. For instance, yeah. Uh, because we are all experiencing so much dread on so many different fronts, that it's hard even for those of us who are making our lives around these crises, around the climate crisis, to think and talk freely about this new level of urgency that's just been communicated by the scientific communi community, which av avoids communicating urgency uh, traditionally, has historically done that. Um, so I think it's definitely ample cause for us all to, uh, like taking out an Etch-a-Sketch, shake it up, look fresh. We're doing this at the Climate Museum. How do we need to respond to this at a new level in our next and second year of programming? And always be open to the idea that we might need to be doing something fundamentally different. I think that's what the world requires of us now, to be radically open to new possibilities. And then any one thing that you guys do, that any one of the four of us does, that anybody in this room does, it's not gonna be enough. Uh, the question is whether it meets the, has the algebraic magic of being some combination of the thing you feel is most important and most likely to be effective and the thing you can bring the most to. And we all have to work out that equation for ourselves with our friends, with our, I call them my committee, with our communities of mentors and advisors and friends but and intimates but it's there's there's no that we're in an unprecedented situation each of us and all of us each of us alone all of us together this has never happened before and we need to recognize that that's going to cause really uncomfortable moments of shifting our own behavior even when it comes to how we express our commitment to addressing the climate crisis and it also is going to require new levels of vulnerability and solidarity with the people around us as we figure out how to respond to what comes next so it will never be enough and there's no simple answer 
Actually, one, one, one thing that I hear coming up in all of your responses uh, is uh, the importance of dialogue, but especially, I think, intergenerational dialogue. You know, if you look at the, the, the corporate CEOs, you know, the politicians who actually have taken action on that, who are sticking out the next, they're doing it for their children, they're doing it for their grandchildren. And to hear it from them, I mean, it's easy enough for us to sort of tune things out, but if we hear it from our children, yeah, and hear the anxiety that they're expressing, and, 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 and actually are engaging in dialogue, which is not so easy, yeah. but I think that, that will be like a long step forward. You're taught in the right direction. I, I'm interested in your work as a as a perception. You study perception, correct? And and actually, or taking a question beyond, you know, uto utopia or dystopia. You know, this or and and in thinking about narrative. My work obviously isn't narrative. I'm trying to think about scale. But in thinking about narrative, it it's something I've thought about a lot. Is that the the iconic image of the blue marble, right, the earth from space, which is really credited widely as having galvanized this whole earth movement and, and starting the ecological movement. And it, maybe there's something fundamentally limited that we have to go beyond that, because that, if you think about it, it's, it's a third person narrative. We are on the outside and we're looking at, you know, a distant planet. Mm -hmm. And the shift, I think, that an artist can make when you're going, as you said, into the limbic is, Acknowledging that we're living here, you know, and it's this planet, and it is our lives, and that that's maybe from third person to first person is another shift, not just utopia, dystopia. And in, in terms of thinking about generation, you know, I'm here in this room right now with my mother and my daughter, so it, it strikes very close to home. Hi, thank you all for your presentations. Um, I was just interested in the uh, um, the program of asking a scientist, and I just uh, wanted to know um, what kind of questions were asked, and uh, if you have any kind of core uh, features when you're working to educate a broad audience about climate change, um, and if that going back to the generational question, if the questions were being asked uh, from different generations or different ways to approach community to those groups? We got a very, th thank you, we got a very broad variety of questions. A lot of them had absolutely no scientific <laughs> character at all. Um, a lot of people wanted to know what they could do, not surprisingly. Um, there was a pretty good dose of do you know that there's a volcano under Yellowstone that's going to explode next month? Um, there, were, there was a pretty good dose of questions like that. There's a fair amount of misinformation um, among sympathetic people. Um, but they were largely what they expressed in their variety and their kind of tone was um, the hunger that people have for opportunities to talk about this phenomenon that they know is occurring, that they're starting to understand is affecting them in the first person. They're pushing that understanding off, because we all do, everybody does, Every, I do. <laughs> um, and uh, they're anxious to, about it and they want to know more and they want to be in conversation with other human beings about, about what's going on. So it was interesting. It wasn't that useful in a pedagogical sense for planning our next scientific outreach event because the questions were all over the map and a lot of them weren't scientific, but it was interesting in a different way than we expected it to be. We also expected to get a, a you know, we had just been noticed by the fascist losers at the Daily Caller two days before, so we were th thinking we might get a kind of concerted denialist um, approach, but no, no, not a single skeptical question all day long, which was also interesting. Uh, hi, one question I'm asking myself and I'm asking you is, how do you know as an artist or also as a scientist if you are making a difference? I mean, you know, we could say, okay, at least I did something, so I don't have to have such a bad conscience. Or you can say I influenced people, maybe on a local level, maybe at least a few people. So art isn't easily measurable. How do you know that what we all do or what you four do actually has an impact? I'm, I'm going to say we don't. Uh, it's one of my favorite questions. I, I'm really, I, th I think you can't quantify with metrics, especially art, 
uh, I, I did a piece called Gone Gitmo. It was uh, putting uh, Guantanamo in second life. And I used to quip that, you know, not one detainee's life was improved by Guantanamo. I mean, here it is, what, 11 years later, it's still at atrocious. And yet, uh, when I say that, I remember it was Christiane who, who broke in and said, no, but you, know, you demonstrated that you could use this meat, you, you, know, you, you brought it up in the, in the media. I don't know who saw it and what changed. Uh, I think with the piece we did in Times Square, you know, how many people went through Times Square? We got these uh, contributions where people wanted to see their city all over the world. So I, th I think this conversation between creator and viewer and uh, you know, producer of the event, the curator or, or museum producer, if that's what you are, the museum, you know, it, it occupies this really unpredictable uh, crevice, right, between messages and, and action, and we don't know. So the answer is I don't, we don't know, but I, I, that doesn't stop me from, from doing it. How's that? I'll say that um, it's not our job. I don't, I don't think it's our job to uh, sit and, and try to measure our value in society and value the contribution that we make. Um, as an artist, you're making th your, your, your work is coming from your beliefs and your belief system. Um, some people make work out of ideas, but I think real, when you get down to it, real art comes from your belief. And um, I, I don't see any room in there for kind of trying to assess uh, the impacts of, of the work you make and try to connect that back to your belief system and stuff. So I think that the role of the artist is really to make art. And I guess you can leave to the uh, statisticians and, the, and uh, I don't know, the people that measure things to try to measure the value of it. But, you know, it's, uh, so that's my thought. I'm sm smiling and I don't mean it to be inappropriate, Justin, I just was thinking, I really wish you two ran large funding organizations. It's a problem, uh, it's, it's a problem with, yeah, with, with, with metrics, problem. it is. I wasn't able to apply and do the head. Sorry. It, uh, you know, it made applying for a second year of Heads Up very difficult because I didn't have any metrics. I didn't know what percentage of people before I did it who went through Times Square knew anything about groundwater because I didn't make that study. So I couldn't compare that with what people thought afterwards. And uh, so while that would have been very useful for me if I wanted to do another Heads Up visualizing climate data on another difficult thing, uh, I, I realized I had to just go on and, and do the next thing. I mean, it, uh, I agree about beliefs. It's also, I wanted to see these things myself, right? I, I needed to see what the aquifer was really like. I needed to go on that elevator beneath the city. I needed, you're making things that you want to see and you're hoping other people also uh, can share that vision in some way. Uh, I mean, I know there's at least one person in the room working with education, uh, so that you want to, how do you know that education works? Uh, you, you open up the space and you give people the richest, you know, children or adults, the richest material you can to work with and then uh, a community to speak with and uh, you hope they go forward. Yeah, so if I can just add quickly, I think Un unlike Peggy and Justin, we don't ever want to instrumentalize art or take a narrow view of its impact, but the effect that it has socially does matter. The, there are plenty of reasons to have a climate museum that have nothing to do with building climate activism and building community and consensus for climate action. It's a totally intellectually rich subject. You could do 500 exhibitions every day and never run out because of the multitude of ways climate change is affecting human and other existence on the planet. But that's not why we're doing it. We're doing it because we want to have that kind of impact. So I resist the idea of reducing it to metrics. Um, they tell you something. They're a kind of scattergram of data points. 
Um, but we can all tell when something is changing culturally and socially in the world around us. Um, we've all experienced cultural and social shifts over the course of our lives. We've seen a major series of cultural and social shifts happen in this country in the last two years. That's something we've all felt and we can talk about um, in an analytic way. And so we shouldn't hold ourselves to a kind of data crunching approach to understanding what our impact is um, and should be prepared to take risks and know that some things won't work, but that uh, I can say with confidence, seeing the audience response to both Peggy's work and Justin's work with us, that it's had a massive impact on the people who've encountered it. Um, and I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Um, a question is about politics. Uh, it seems that your exhibitions are concentrated on mostly liberal cities. Uh, I don't know whether you remember about 10, 15 years ago, uh, Frank Luntz, who was a uh, Republican strategist, <coughs> tried hard and he succeeded in changing the, the, the phrase global warming to climate change uh, because that was less threatening to Republicans. So what are you doing to change the mindset of Republicans and conservatives? Because, I mean, showing it to people in LA and New York I don't think it would make a big difference, but showing it to the people in the Midwest supporting Trump and his, his allies, I mean, how are we going to change that mindset? I think it's a very valid, uh, very valid point. Um, I'm a small studio, art studio, and, and I, have a, I have a really difficult time as an individual really reaching out and getting the work out beyond New York as a whole. Um, the billboards in this project that Four Freedoms this has done is spread out across all 50 states. So I have a billboard that just went up today in Alaska, in Anchorage, Alaska. So those are pretty important demographics. Uh, Chicago, Oklahoma, um, and of course we did this project in New York City the, with climate signals. Um, I'm actually in the process of getting ready to travel my signs. So the We Are the Asteroid, when it comes down from Storm King, it's going to start traveling around the country. We're probably going to travel a couple of them. We're getting a lot of interest from um, institutions all around the country that are interested in showing these. Uh, we're also going to London. I'm going to be showing in London next year. I think it's really important to get it out there. I know I struggle even to get stuff done in here, um, but it's not. There's no... Um, there's no real easy way to just get work out in, in, in the broad public around the country in the areas where we need to get these conversations and messages out to. So it's a challenge. It's a challenge from a, as a, I'm just telling you from, a, from the perspective of an, of an individual artist who's working on, these, on the subject matter and I happen to be based in New York. Uh, it's a challenge to be able to get stuff in Oklahoma you know, or in these other institutions and, and, and work with other institutions. It's, it's not impossible. In fact, it's, it's probably easy if I had a staff of people that could manage it. And so, uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm a small. But I, I think it's incredibly important, your, your point. So. Maybe add to this. I think labels matter, and I think yes, but you can. It, it goes both ways, you know. So the fact that the Republican Party is not talking about a carbon tax, but talking about a carbon dividend, you know, uh, dividends are great, right? We get money rather than sort of paying money. It just sends like a different metaphor out there, a diff different image. Uh, and yeah, also maybe the other thing would be to uh, the ideal. Ad to, to, to get climate change away as this uh, ideological litmus test. It used to be abortion, yeah? now it, I think climate change has become sort of the uh, uh, litmus test that shows what, who's tri what tribe you belong to. Let's find something else. And I think sort of you know, to your point about sort of having that marble of Earth out there, I mean, that image shows us that we're in this together. I mean, it's everyone, it's, it's our planet that, that's at risk. Yeah? And it doesn't matter what's a red or a blue danger, it, it, it's a danger to all of us. But I think sort of we, 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 you have to hate someone for something. Yeah? And the question is, what else can we find you know, to, to take that place that we can actually start working on this image on this on this issue that is you know of, of, of fundamental existential importance to us I actually I want to respectfully disagree with the premise of the question in a couple of different ways I think first New York more people from Oklahoma will see a climate exhibit in New York City 
um, than would see it if it were in Oklahoma City. It's a huge domestic tourism market, and it's one of the m market arguments that we make for the Climate Museum being here. It's where domestic tourists come if they're interested in culture. Either you're going to Disneyland or Vegas, or you're coming to D New York. Um, uh, in international terms, it dwarfs the next biggest draw for tourism, which is Miami, um, by a factor of like four or something. So New, New York City is not just a place where New Yorkers take in culture, it's a place where the whole country does. But I also think if we can build on the strength of the people who are out there who understand that there's a problem, a number that's gonna grow and cross ideological divides, people, some people may have seen some of the stories and the torrents of news we encounter these days, it's incredible what I miss every day. But after Michael, there were people from deep red districts softening their language on climate change. The weather is going to break down some of those uh, cultural identitarian politics around climate. It's gonna involve a tremendous amount of trauma and suffering, unfortunately, uh, but, it, but it will break some of it down. And I also think in order to build the kind of movement broadly and the kind of cultural shift that we're talking about, we should be focused on people who are almost there. We need the low hanging fruit. I'm fine if Inhofe comes to the Climate Museum as long as he doesn't have a baseball bat, but I'm, I don't care. I don't care if he comes. Um, it's not, we have so many people who are so much closer to playing a meaningful community role in galvanizing um, our society to move forward on climate. And I don't, I'm pretty indifferent to people who have decided that they disagree. I'll let the weather change their mind and then work with them once they soften up a little. I, I grabbed the mic because I I just wanted to ask a question too. Um, and I was very encouraged by what you said, what you observed with the mother-daughter conversation. And and I just want to bring that up because I remember that from my own childhood and I you know, went to school in Germany at a time when environmental awareness was probably stronger there than it was here at the time. And some teacher <laughs> brought in this theater performance about the planet being destroyed. And, and it, was, it was really super effective, I feel, for all the children who went to this performance. And why am I saying this? Because, of course, this is all related to education. And, and, and you uh, were talking about the fact, like, how many people go to see museums, and that, that isn't quite that that is quite wonderful but at the same time i feel like projects like yours where you know the museums go like bring projects to 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 the public the public the, the art as public art i think this has something that that you know bridges the gap that one of you mentioned earlier the gap between what we see and what exists i'm quoting one of you and and i feel the education is is so important in this context and to bring the art that creates the bigger awareness of climate change into the streets or into the schools or brings the kids to that art whatever in sunset park uh I think that is really crucial, and this is a long prologue to, to asking you as an educator uh, at a university how, how you feel, how the, the, your university or in your experiences at different uh, institutions of higher learning, how, how do you feel the universities are dealing with this, these questions in terms of you know, um, raising the awareness transdisciplinary of students because they, they have that possibilities. And are they really doing it? And do you perhaps also know something how universities do that in Germany, if you're aware of that? So I, I can speak to the United States. I'm not so familiar anymore with what's happening in universities in Germany. Uh, but I think what universities are doing extremely well is educating the, the, the new generation about the risks. I think you know, they're, 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 they're struggling more with sort of uh, educating them about solutions. Yeah? I mean, so Princeton uh, is, 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 is starting to do something what they call campus as a lab. Uh, and so to instill the kind of values, whether they have to do with eating, whether they have to do with you know, sort of your, your, your habits about water use, you know, about electricity use, about plastics and so on. Uh, basically taking the opportunity that we have uh, these 
young people for four years, and we can show by example, you know, sort of how things can be done. Uh, oftentimes, you know, we, we, we imitate behavior. We imitate behavior of people that we care about, you know, of, of, of role models. Uh, but also we imitate the behavior of people around us, you know, and so to sort of basically sort of start to train little ambassadors, you know, who, 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 who learn good habits, you know, in, 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 in the energy and the environmental space, who then actually sort of go home for Thanksgiving, for Christmas, you know, who start their own families down the road. So I think sort of generationally, I think we're doing actually a pretty good job in addressing you know, sort of uh, uh, climate norms and climate behavior. The problem, I think, is that sort of behaviors have to change so much more fast. Yeah? Uh, and, and so, I mean, th things always change generationally. Basically, the old people die off. Yeah? Old companies die off. New companies get started. New companies survive. New companies thrive. The question is, can we do this until 2040 or 2050? Or is that evolutionary scale of changing things too slow in this, in this space? Um, I guess my question is about communication. Um, there's a, I'll just frame this because there's a really good quote um, by Frederick Jameson, I think, um, talks about seeing the end. We can see the end of capitalism. We can see the end of our way of society, but we can't see the birth of the new one. I kind of wanted to start from you, Justin, maybe then you, Elka. Um, the project that you did, We Are the Asteroid, um, how did you come about with the words that you selected, the words that you chose? Because they aren't, 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 aren't kind of like negative messaging kind of, doesn't that kind of make people double down on the fatality of things as well? So yeah, and then Elka, I guess, like what is a good way of talking about climate change to galvanize action as well? So We Are the Asteroid is an aphorism that Timothy Morton gave me. Um, and I don't know if anybody here is familiar with his work. Uh, Tim is a, he's an object-oriented ontologist. Um, he's a philosopher, professor of English um, over at Rice University. And I was reading one of his books, uh, a book called Hyper Objects, uh, and really relating to everything he was writing about and, and, and talking about in, in the book. And I reached out to him to see if he would be willing to work with me. Um, because he had a way to position a lot of these ideas in, in, in ways that were not so on the nose and not so, they were playful. They were like these little like haiku. I was envisioning, I was envisioning something very short for this project, but the way he writes, he writes in a very pithy manner and he can embed a lot of meaning um, in, in, the, in the way he writes, but he, he, he writes with a, a real sense of humor. And so one of the things that rides throughout all of the aphorisms that I tend to work with is a sense of humor, especially with, with they're coming from Tim. I know I'm not a writer, so I reached out to him because I knew I couldn't write these myself. And I knew he was humorous, and then that was kind of the way that, that was the way in. So We Are the Asteroid, a lot of people actually don't quite understand it when they hear it. Um, and they, they have to think about it a little bit, and, like, and, and I've, had, I've heard all different interpretations of it which is really good, actually. It's very open, it's very open-ended. Um, and I think that's a really important way to kind of approach this, at least as an artist. Uh, I'm not trying to be didactic, I'm not trying to, gee, I'm trying to help you, give you uh, new ways to think about things. That's my job as an artist. I'm trying to create new uh, structures, uh, new um, languages, new vocabularies for you to be able to understand kind of this world that we live in. That's my, that's how I see my role. Um, my role is not to tell you how to think. I'm here to try to teach you how to think. Um, and so I think that's a really important part of the, of the project. But that's why, so that's, all the language reflects that. It, it's all very open-ended. So you can kind of enter it in many different ways and kind of come out. And, and hopefully, as you come out, there's some residue left in there. And I've been able to shift things a little bit. But it's, so it's kind of subversive in that way. Um, but I forgot your question entirely. I mean, essentially, you were asking. I mean, the w the words you select. Kind yeah. Of the, um, especially with like um, things like if things are a disaster or if things are going to go bad. Yeah. Uh, that usually elicits quite a protective response from yeah. people, especially if you're doing public campaigning messaging. Yeah. Um, and that really makes them double down on yes. the position that they have. Yeah, so I mean all the text, for We Are the Asteroid 1 and 2, they're all very playful. 
uh, for the text we did with Miranda, with the Climate Museum, the Climate Signals project, it's a bit more um, it's a bit more on the nose. It's a bit more kind of activistic type language. Uh, it was all geared up really to not talk about ecology in a broad way, which is what my other projects are, but it was more focused on climate change. It's a climate museum. This was a climate change, really climate change related project. So um, it, the, 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 the one thing I told Miranda when we were going through the list and trying to come up, you know, call from a long list of the, what the aphorisms we were going to use, I kept telling Miranda, I said, we got to keep this one in because it's playful. And, and the playful ones are what really help keep people engaged um, because you don't, you don't want to just give them dire, direness. And so if you go through and you watch all the, if you read them all, a lot of them are playing off the sign, you know, the fact that it's a highway sign. And so they play off of that. And so anyway. So, so yeah, the other question is, you know, sort of what, what positive can come of this, right? Uh, which might be a, a, a good way to end this <laughs> until we go out for drinks. Uh, but let me say uh, that I think sort of uh, Angela Merkel actually is a master at not, never letting a good crisis go unutilized. Yeah? So she always sort of figures out how to get something that she wants to have done because all of a sudden attention has been raised that something is a problem. Uh, and I think so one way to think about the, the, the climate crisis is to, for us to reevaluate uh, how we define human happiness. Yeah? And we, we know that our current lifestyles, you know, this consumerist lifestyle, gets us on the hedonic treadmill. It doesn't make us, you know, of course, you know, sort of material things happen you know, sort of up, up to a certain sort of level of, of, of comfort and security. But beyond that, we know these things don't make us happy. You know, it's, it's, it's communal things that make us happy. Uh, commuting to our Mac mansions in the suburbs doesn't make us happy. You know? And so to take, take this as an opportunity to, to reevaluate how we in the Western world define human happiness yeah? and maybe to change that because at the same time we are, we are poster children for how the rest of the world wants to live and, and rightfully so, everybody has the same right, right to even now in our case unhappiness and unsustainability uh, but yeah, we have to basically lead by example and I think sort of one silver lining that comes you know, sort of from this crisis might be the, 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 the motivation to do so because things can't go on the way they can. Yeah? If, if things just continue their merry old way, we, we're never going to change things but yeah, if we have to, and if we can come to the realization that we do have to, yeah, then maybe that's an opportunity. This was a very nice way of wrapping things up. I don't have to say anything more besides saying thank you to our four panelists. Wonderful contributions, great work, very inspiring. Um, thank you for engaging in um, dialogue with uh, the panelists and w with each other, and hopefully we can continue this a little bit longer outside. and. Keep thinking, um, keep uh, reusing stuff, go vote and do whatever you can to make the world a better place. This is cheesy, but anyway, thank you so much. Yeah.